On the night of November 9, 1989, the Berlin Wall came tumbling down, bringing an end to 40 long years of division, violence, and pain. 17 million citizens of East Germany were suddenly free to travel, to say whatever they liked, to live their lives like other Western Europeans. But in the weeks after the wall fell, reality set in. Would East Germany be allowed to complete its peaceful revolution? Or would this turn of events spark a violent backlash? And we had 350,000 Soviet soldiers, crack troops, armed to the teeth in that very small territory. This is the story of 11 tumultuous months when the largest nation in Europe raced against time to reunite itself before it lost the chance. The ever-present danger that Gorbachev would simply lose control. Leaders had to contend with radically changed political realities. She could never quite put behind her this unease about the reunified Germany of 80 million people. They went in all sweetness and light. And ordinary Germans suddenly found themselves living in a brand new nation. I became unemployed and it hit like a bomb. In the end, it took less than one year to bring the divided Germany back together. We felt like we were on fast forward, permanently. Political courage, personal sacrifice, and secrets revealed when the people of Germany reinvented their nation. Major funding for After the Wall, A World United, was provided by a grant from the Robert Bosch Stiftung, supporting international understanding and research and teaching in the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. The Rios Berlin Commission, preserving the ideals of German-American friendship. The Ed Rochelle Foundation, benefiting charitable, scientific, literary, and educational initiatives. Fresenius Medical Care, providing products and support for chronic kidney diseases. And the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, a German political foundation promoting freedom, peace, and justice through educational programs. With additional funding from the Fondren Foundation, Shell Oil Company, and Houston Zangerbund. On November 10, 1989, President George H.W. Bush received a phone call from the Chancellor of West Germany, Helmut Kohl. The Chancellor was ecstatic about what had happened in Berlin the night before. The wall had been opened through a bureaucratic mistake. And suddenly, the German Democratic Republic, otherwise known as East Germany, was in the throes of a democratic revolution. While Bush may have shared Cole's euphoria in private, in public, he was far more restrained. We all rushed over to President Bush the next day and said, you must go to Berlin, you must go for Kennedy, you must go for Reagan. And he said, and what would I do when I got there, dance on the wall? He said, this is a German moment. Bush deliberately acted unexcited. And of course, I welcome the decision by the East German leadership to open the borders to those wishing to emigrate or travel. He knew that we had unfinished business with the Soviet Union, and he wasn't about to stick it in their eye. No triumphalism. I remember him saying that. No triumphalism. They saw that we were going to act prudently, as I used to say. He got kidded by a, a Dana Carvey about that. Wouldn't be prudent. Not going to do it. Well, that's, that, it is prudent to do certain things, and sometimes not taking dramatic action is prudent and right thing to do. So far, Germany has done a magnificent job. In, uh, Bush was refusing to claim a win for one reason. Mikhail Gorbachev, the embattled general secretary of the Soviet Union. 
For four years, Gorbachev had been introducing radical reforms in the USSR. Gorbachev wanted to reform the Soviet Union, to improve its economy, to improve the daily life for people in the Soviet Union. But now, the hardliners in his own government were questioning whether he had gone too far. What he did not expect was the opening of the Berlin Wall, which was a spectacular accident. That was not what he wanted. And he's on the back foot, he's not taking the initiative, he's reacting to what is happening on the ground in Germany. And Gorbachev was a guy on a tightrope uh, with a lot of people trying to shake the tightrope uh, so that he would either stop walking it or would fall off of it. Bush knew that if the United States turned the fall of the Berlin Wall into a major propaganda issue, it would only weaken Gorbachev's position at home. But he had a lot at stake there if he saw this whole thing un unraveling on his watch. Why well, He didn't know how his military would react, how people would react around the world. And I emphasize that we need to act in a way that would make this process not chaotic and not cataclysmic. There were nearly 400,000 Soviet troops stationed in East Germany. Gorbachev had said publicly that he would not use force to intervene in other Soviet bloc nations. But could he keep that promise? Conditions in the Soviet Union in 1990 were as bad as they had been at the end of the Second World War. The economy is in a terrible state. There's shortages. Uh, there's all kinds of unrest. There's protests against Gorbachev's leadership. And he's deeply unpopular. While the immediate fear was violence in this suddenly unstable East Germany, European leaders had another reason to be on edge. They saw the political order of Europe about to change. At the end of World War II, the defeated Germany was split into two parts by the victorious Allies. But now, with the Berlin Wall gone, the door was suddenly open to uniting the two Germanys again. A reunited Germany would become one of the largest and certainly the most populous nation on the continent overnight. It was a prospect that worried Germany's neighbors on all sides. And that was forgivable. If you look at the history of the 20th, uh, 20th century, a unified and powerful Germany had uh, brought a lot of uh, ruin uh, to the world and I might add to itself uh, and certainly to its, uh, certainly to its neighbors. West German leader Helmut Kohl had long dreamed of reuniting his nation. But he knew he would have to proceed very cautiously. You never knew how our partners will react, uh, how will uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher react, how will Francois Mitterrand react. Uh, this was not welcomed by everybody. <laughs> it was mainly not welcomed by President Gorbachev. Uh, his answer was, uh, this is a dictate by the German Chancellor and he wouldn't accept that. In the days after the wall fell, Europe's leaders convened to discuss the events. Britain's Margaret Thatcher made it clear to Kohl that any talk of German unification was premature. I think you're going much too fast, much too fast. You have to take these things step by step and handle them very wisely. Rationally, she knew that Germany after 1945 was very different to Germany before. Nonetheless, like many people of her generation and many other European leaders in the 1980s, she could never quite put behind her this unease about what a reunified Germany of 80 million people might represent in Europe. As it turned out, unification would be out of the control of any of the world's leaders. It was the people of Germany who would set the pace. First night when the wall came down, there was really this party because it was a big event. The underground trains, the buses, the whole city of West Berlin was overcrowded with people. 
In the first few days after the wall fell, one million East Germans traveled to West Berlin. Nine million came the first week. Dieter Rosengarten was an East Berlin factory worker. When the wall came down initially, we were happy, and everyone was very excited when it came to work. Don't start the machines. The borders are open. Let's go to West Berlin. And then we went shopping. The visiting East Germans thronged West Berlin's department stores, bars, and even the sex shops that were forbidden in their homeland. In the beginning, they were greeted with a welcome package, including 100 Deutschmarks to spend however they liked. When the wall came down uh, and the shoppers first got to go to West Berlin, the items that sold out the quickest were fruits, candy, and porn. <laughs> to some West Berliners, it began to feel like their city was being taken over. Berlin was suddenly a 24-hour party town with a strange soundtrack supplied by people who became known as wall peckers. And I think I'm not sure, but I think it was forbidden to pick at the wall, but nobody cared about that. And you had the noise. You heard all the picking the whole night and people talking and the first weeks laughing. Kira von Moors was 20 years old in November 1989. She had lived her whole life in West Berlin, rarely coming into contact with East Berliners just a few miles away. In the weeks after the wall opened, she took long walks through her changed city, exploring streets that had been behind the wall for almost 30 years. I just stepped back and forth and back and forth and looked down and try to find some traces or something I know. I, I just tried to understand what I saw, and I did not the first two weeks. Some West Berliners began to worry whether their city could absorb the newcomers. There are a lot of young families in West Berlin who have been waiting for houses and who are afraid that they will be taken away by the people coming now. But it was East Germany that was about to see the biggest changes. For 40 years, the GDR had been a police state. Every aspect of life was familiar, predictable, carefully controlled. Now that world was disappearing almost overnight. And even as East Germans took to the streets to welcome their democratic revolution, they began to realize that personal freedom would come at a cost. They had to learn that you can lose your job, you can lose your flat, and uh, nothing is guaranteed. The whole situation for people changed in months. The tumultuous period came to be called the Wende, the turnaround. For young East Germans like Alex Schultz, anything was suddenly possible. For me, the Wende, or I should say revolution, came at the right time. I was 19, I had just finished school, and one way or another I had to reorganize my life. Of course, for older people, it was a different story. Old and young, all East Germans were about to see their nation's economy turned upside down. In the West German capital, Bonn, the first days after the wall fell presented a difficult political challenge. What we didn't know, and this was the really interesting question, uh, uh, um, was uh, what was the public opinion in the GDR. We knew that there were many, many people who wanted uh, a reunified Germany, but uh, we didn't know whether this was a small majority, whether this was an overwhelming majority.
But within two weeks, Kohl's team learned the Kremlin and East Germany were discussing the issue. And Kohl was jolted into action. I told the Chancellor, look, you have to take the lead. I realized something had to happen. We decided I had to make a statement. It was overdue. Cole called his closest advisors together to craft a speech over the weekend. It was Thursday afternoon. I got a call from his secretary. Uh, tonight there's a meeting is, uh, in his home and uh, he wants to discuss uh, um, uh, what to do now with Germany. And on November 28th, less than one month after the wall fell, Kohl addressed the Bundestag and offered a 10-point plan for the unification of Germany, something he predicted would happen in five to 10 years. The EG darf nicht an der Elbe enden, sondern muss die Offenheit auch nach Osten war. Kohl had given the speech without consulting any of his allies. His foreign partners were not happy. So much was at stake, not just for Germany, but for NATO, for the Western Alliance, for American power in Europe, for U.S.-Soviet relations. So much was at stake to be confronted with, uh, presented with uh, the German Chancellor's 10 points without having been consulted, kind of reading them in the newspaper, if you will, it was not a good start to the partnership between the United States and Germany in managing this. Also, ich hatte eine so I had a pretty bad situation. A lot of people were offended, but I have to say in retrospect, if I had asked a lot of people beforehand, I would have never given the speech. As the German Chancellor, I had to act independently. Kohl's gamble paid off. Thanks in part to the speech, the Chancellor would become personally identified with unification. And despite the rough start, President Bush signaled his support. At a NATO summit meeting a few weeks later, the president told Cole the United States was fully behind his efforts to bring the two Germanys together. And as we began to see that it, it could happen on my watch, or we could help bring it about, and particularly in, with the break of the wall coming down, uh, then that, that got right up at the top of the priority charts. So we didn't have to have all of those meetings about whether or not we supported the unification of Germany. The president had set that course. And I think it helped us because from then on, it was just a matter of tactics. How would we get there? It wouldn't be easy. At least one big challenge remained. To convince Margaret Thatcher of Britain and Francois Mitterrand of France that a united Germany would be good for Europe. Mitterrand's statement, I love Germany so much I think there should be two of them. You know, this was, this was a joke, but this is the way, this is what we were up against. Everyone knew the window of opportunity might be brief. It all depended on how long Gorbachev could hold on to power. It was a complex problem but a very important one for the United States and obviously for Germany and I think for Europe. But uh, it, it, uh, it wasn't all sweetness and light. In Berlin, the ugly wall that had separated the city for 29 years was being removed day by day. And the East German government that had been a dictatorship for 40 years was reinventing itself into a democracy. The new leader of the GDR, Hans Modrow, now had to share power with a group called the Round Table, which included some of the German dissidents and activists who had helped bring about the fall of the wall. Many of them saw this revolution as a chance to build a new, free nation that would take the best of both West and East. They had high hopes for something new, something different from the kind of socialism they had before, but some sort of human socialism, some sort of third way to a new kind of socialism. 
Among the dissidents at the round table was Ulrike Pappe. We envisioned a reunified Germany that was different from just a larger West Germany. So we developed new ideas about protecting the environment, about how to involve citizens directly in the democratic process. The highest priority of the roundtable was to organize East Germany's first ever free elections as soon as possible. A date was set for mid-March, barely four months after the wall had opened. Some of the activists who had resisted the old regime leapt at the chance to run for public office. Vera Lengsfeld became a parliamentary candidate for the East German Green Party. We had the feeling that uh, we created an entirely new society according to our ideas, our wishes, our illusions as well. Lengsfeld and her colleagues didn't realize that the elections would mark an end, not a beginning. And that for some, the democratic revolution would also lead to painful revelations. In mid-December 1989, about six weeks after the wall fell, West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl made his first visit to East Germany in many years. As he got off the plane, the Chancellor was greeted by a sea of West German flags in the heart of East Germany. I turned around to Minister Seiters behind me, and I could see in his look, he was stunned. I said to him, the game is won. But despite the obvious passion for unification in East Germany, Kohl spoke that night with caution. He could have acted as a demagogue, and uh, there were thousands and thousands of people who would have been prepared to do almost everything, <laughs> he would have uh, told them. But uh, he did not do that. On the contrary, it was a very low-key speech. The chancellor kept it low-key for a good reason. He knew how anxious his allies already were about the prospect of a giant new Germany. By January 1990, just two months after the wall fell, dark secrets of the East German dictatorship were coming to light. The state security police, known as the Stasi, were headquartered here. Anonymous buildings in a nondescript East Berlin neighborhood. From this office suite, the Stasi's longtime head, Erich Milke, controlled a force of 90,000 agents and hundreds of thousands of informants. For decades, the Stasi kept every aspect of life in East Germany under careful watch. Thousands of suspected enemies of the state had been imprisoned. Ulrike Papa was one of them detained in a Stasi prison in the 1980s. So she knew the secret police had an extensive file on her and her family. But she was stunned to learn after the wall came down that the Stasi had detailed her personal life in a collection of more than 50 volumes. I knew that we were being observed. That was obvious. But they put together so many files so meticulously, with observation reports, transcriptions of phone calls, and, of course, all these reports from snitches, that did surprise me. Finally, on January 15, 1990, the Stasi's long-time grip on East Germany would come to a dramatic end. That night, Ulrike Pappe was with her colleagues at a meeting of the roundtable when a phone call came. 
an angry mob was storming the Stasi headquarters just a few miles away. Alle Informationen at the round table. All we heard was that things were turning violent and that the Stasi people were being lynched. That really frightened us. Hans Modrow asked Poppe and other dissident leaders to rush over with him to defuse the situation. In an ironic twist, this time, the dissidents were helping the police. By the time they arrived, thousands of demonstrators had charged through the gates into the building complex. And there was a crowd in the yard. People were running up the stairs. We called through a megaphone. No violence, no violence. But there really was no violence. Pape joined hundreds of her fellow East Germans wandering through the deepest reaches of the secret police headquarters. They discovered a mind-boggling array of espionage tools, spy cameras, secret microphones. Here I was, walking through their sacred halls, saw their offices and felt, we did it. We overthrew the Stasi, the people who for four decades had so much power over all of us. And they uncovered the products of the Stasi's pervasive spying. Millions of files on East Germany's citizens. I held a Stasi file in my hands. I saw records on people I knew. What to do with the Stasi files was one of the most important issues for the round table. Today, Mariana Bietler is the director of the Stasi archives. She is the keeper of this highly sensitive information. She recalls the sharp disagreements over what to do with the files when the Stasi vaults were first opened. Some people said we should destroy the files because they were created by criminals. And if we keep them, they will cause harm. Others said everybody should take their own file home. Some wanted to make a bonfire with the files. There was another problem. In their final days in power, Stasi agents attempted to destroy an estimated 45 million documents. When their electric paper shredders burned out, the agents simply tore the paper into pieces. And these weren't just any documents. They contain some of the secrets of the last days of the GDR. This, this is logic, because it makes sense. Stasi officers didn't bother to shred the old files. It's what they had on their desks they had to get rid of in a hurry. Those files could be dangerous. There are an estimated 16,000 bags of ripped and shredded documents slowly being reconstructed. It's painstaking but important work. By February of 1990, the East German election campaign was in full swing. The citizens were treated to a spectacle they hadn't seen in almost 60 years, a wide open political contest. West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl wasn't a candidate in these East German elections, but he campaigned like one, representing the East German wing of his party, the Christian Democrats, or CDU, the Conservative Party. As the leader of West Germany, Kohl stood for something beyond politics in East Germany. Food, security, material comforts. East German citizens had made do with a lower standard of living for 40 years. 
Now, they saw a chance to get the same kind of life they had seen on West German TV for decades. And I think this is nothing which they should be ashamed of. This was simply the West German model was the role model for the East Germans. And then immediately, unexpectedly, there was a possibility to get the West German way of life. And that's what the people wanted, yeah. And nothing symbolized West German economic prosperity like their currency, the Deutschmark. The Deutschmark had become, after World War II, a symbol not only of monetary stability, not only of economic success, but also of political stability, of the success of West German democracy. So it was much more than just a currency. But while East Germans were being tantalized with West German goods, they didn't have the West German marks they needed to buy them. And so they soon started to say, if the Deutsche Mark doesn't come to us, we will come to the Deutsche Mark. It was clear to the West German government, we will have a problem if there will be an unorganized chaotic movement of East German people to West Germany. So, Helmut Kohl and East German leader Hans Modro made an agreement they hoped would keep East Germans from migrating to the West. East Germans would be able to trade in their almost worthless money for the coveted West German marks at a rate of one to one. It was an extravagant gesture by the West, based on politics. What the economic cost would be, nobody knew. Well, the mystery of Helmut Kohl is that he was not a particularly good economist. He's not a trained economist. But I think he has a deep feeling for the popular mood and the desperation of, industri of people living in rundown industrial areas. Despite Kohl's popularity in the East, observers thought the liberal social democrats would get the votes. After more than 40 years of a socialist system, of people growing up in a socialist system, people in West Germany expected there would be much more socialists or at least social democrats or something like that. And the dissidents, who had band together into new parties of their own, also expected to do well. After all, they had sparked the revolution. But as the election got closer, the dissidents began to realize that perhaps their countrymen had a different vision for their future. One day I got in a taxi cab at the airport and the driver said, I would like to vote for you because my heart is with you, but I'm going to vote for those who have the money the Conservative Party, because I trust them. Our economy has hit rock bottom. We need the money to get back on our feet again. I could understand that. People were longing for dependable political leadership, and they saw that in the West, where the Conservative Party was in power. And East German voters, used to sham elections, suddenly found themselves being courted as never before. They were really amazed that an election campaign um, could be like this, with free beer and campaigners uh, fighting for votes. This was never heard in East Germany. On March 18, 1990, when East Germans turned out to vote in their first free elections ever. Even the weather smiled on them. 
what I found very surprising and amazing was people going to the ballots. Many women had uh, flowers in their hands and they had a certain look at their faces, uh, like going to church or something like that. Yeah? Like going to do a holy thing. In East Berlin, at the Palace of the Republic, the seat of East Germany's government, the candidates gathered. Throughout the day, most observers still expected the Social Democrats to prevail. But by 6 p.m., when the results started coming in, it was obvious. An upset was in the works. Helmut Kohl's conservative party, the CDU, was pulling ahead in the socialist GDR. The message was clear. East Germans wanted unification with West Germany as soon as possible. But for some East Germans, it felt like a huge opportunity had been lost. We talked about free elections. We talked, yes, about huge ideals, liberty, equality, brotherhood, the motto of every revolution. And suddenly, only material things were within reach. So what was it all about? We thought it was about liberty, but really, it was Marlboro, Mallorca, Mallorca, Deutsche Mark, and the Deutsche Mark. Und in dem Moment, wo das and the second that was achieved, war alles Engagement the spirit of the movement was abandoned. Diese Revolution war keine Revolution. And the revolution was no longer a revolution. For the East German opposition leaders who had envisioned a new kind of nation, the outcome signaled the end of their movement. Only a handful of opposition candidates won. Among them was Vera Langsfeld, who would take a seat in the new East German parliament representing the Green Party. But not long after, like many East Germans, Langsfeld discovered a dark side to the new freedom a revelation from the Stasi files. In December 91, I was told by a former colleague of mine that my former husband was an um, unofficial uh, cooperator of the Stasi. As soon as I was sure that it was true, I separated from my husband and um, started a new life. Ten years later, he wrote me a letter saying that he agreed to cooperate with the Stasi because he feared that because I was a very active person in the opposition movement, he was worried that I could be arrested one day. So I believed him and um, I'm done with <laughs> the whole thing. With the Iron Curtain pulled aside, it became starkly clear that the unification of East Germany with West Germany would not be a marriage of equals. For one thing, the GDR was one of the most polluted countries in Europe. I think a year after the wall came down, I think it was 1990, I went by train with a friend of mine and we passed uh, the southern part of East Germany and it looked just awful. It looked um, broken and it looked dirty and you saw all these little lakes which were really colored red blue green of chemical stuff and the friend beside me didn't stop talking about the cost and repeated like, like a boy with such eyes who will pay for that who will pay for that and i think we knew that we put pay for that but um yeah for people who saw it for the first time, 
It was, of course, shocking. It was just a general gut feeling that this must be awfully expensive. What um, magnitude it would come up to was completely open. The environmental catastrophe reflected a deeper problem. East Germany's industry was broken down and obsolete. The state of the Eastern German economy was disastrous. It had a rundown infrastructure, it had a rundown capital stock, and it was basically lacking any entrepreneurial initiative that has be, had been uh, uh, killed off uh, in the decades uh, when the economy was isolated from the world market. Perhaps the best known symbol of East Germany's obsolete economy was the Trabant, the ubiquitous affordable car made out of plastic resin. Powered by a highly polluting two-stroke engine, the Trabi was ridiculed by West Germans, while East Germans had to wait 15 years to buy one. For former East Berliner Dieter Rosengarten, his Trabis represent more than just a collection of aging cars. They are what remains of the life that came to an end in 1990. Yeah, opens and closes smoothly. It's really in mint condition. It's a reminder of the good old days in the GDR. When we all had jobs, things were safe. As the two Germanys merged into one, a government-run trust oversaw the privatization of East Germany's state-owned industry. The trust sold off hundreds of unproductive and inefficient East German factories, many of which were soon closed down. And East Germans, used to lifetime employment, were suddenly thrown out of work. We really didn't get it. We didn't understand what was going on. First, we lost our jobs. That hit us like a bomb. All of a sudden, we were sitting at home. We weren't used to that. We didn't have unemployment in the GDR. There were roughly 2.5 million industrial jobs lost from 4 million. So two out of three jobs disappeared and another 500,000 disappeared in the years to come. So this is the most massive, sudden industrial restructuring that has ever happened in world history. Chancellor Kohl and other West Germans predicted economic prosperity for the East. But they couldn't work miracles. Even when new management took over the Trabi factory and produced a much improved Trabant with a Volkswagen engine, it was too little, too late. In the case of the Trabi, it didn't survive because people may have loved their Trabi under socialist conditions, but they didn't really love it anymore in the new conditions. The car that East Germans once waited years for sat unsold by the thousands. It was simply the market which destroyed it. German unification has taken a human toll too. A whole wave, roughly one million people, went into early retirement. And that is one of the most sad parts of uh, German unification. For the majority of East Germans, life has gotten better, but at a higher cost than anyone ever anticipated. Spring 1990. Seven months after the fall of the wall, German unification was racing ahead politically and symbolically. In Berlin, a historic icon of the Cold War was about to disappear. Checkpoint Charlie was the symbol of the confrontation in the Cold War. 
So in the spring of uh, 1990, here we were negotiating the unification of Germany. And what better way to show the way that we could collaborate than to take away this symbol of the conflict and do it together. For Soviet officials, it was yet another sign that their Eastern European empire was coming to an end. It wasn't easy for Edward Shevardnadze, the Soviet foreign minister, to come to the American sector and stand with the American, the French, the British foreign ministers, along with the East and West German foreign ministers, and see Checkpoint Charlie being taken away. Among the Allies, Britain and France had put aside their objections, but one roadblock to unification remained. Which international military alliance would this new Germany belong to? The East? The West? Neither? Or both? East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, was a member of the Warsaw Pact, uh, the pact that the Soviet Union established as a counterweight to NATO, to the West, and uh, it was not at all a foregone conclusion that the Soviets would ever agree to German unification as a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Some were saying NATO was no longer necessary in a post-Cold War world. Bush and his team saw it differently. Without NATO, the United States would have had no reason to be in Europe. We saw NATO as the strategic pillar for the new Europe and as the strategic home for American power in Europe. But would Gorbachev agree to let his former satellite join the other side? Okay, everybody out this way, I got Against that backdrop, Gorbachev arrived in Washington in May of 1990 for a summit meeting with George Bush. The Americans knew Gorbachev was under enormous political pressure at home. The Soviet economy was in deep trouble. Could that help persuade him? As the meeting got underway, Bush's team strategized their approach. Bob Blackwell, who was the senior director for this region of the NSC staff and I, tried to prepare the point for uh, President Bush to make to President Gorbachev at the table to say, look, under your own logic, uh, a unified Germany should be able to choose its alliance. Now, this is an important diplomatic point. It's not saying we're insisting they be in NATO. We're saying we insist that they have the right to choose. How are you? Good to see you. At what felt like the right moment, Bush posed the question. Oh, I can absolutely remember that moment when we were at the summit and we had all wondered what would Gorbachev say. We had Germany on the side, uh, France and Britain, of course. Now what about the Soviet Union? Gorbachev was saying, well, maybe, you know, countries should be free to join each. Then President Bush said, Germany should have the right to choose its own alliances. He was asked the question, uh, Mr. General Secretary, don't you, would you, would you not agree that um, a country should have the right to choose whatever alliance it wants to join? He said, of course. And Gorbachev said, yes, that's right. And we all sort of were startled. So uh, one of my deputies sent a note to the president saying, ask him the question again. And Scowcroft handed me a note over my shoulder like this. He was sitting behind me, Jimmy Baker over here, handed me a note. He said, make him repeat this. And uh, I, I thought I understood the profundity of what he had said, but I wasn't sure. And so I said, well, Mikhail, let me, let me be clear on this. Uh, it, you know, what you're saying is self-determination. Gorbachev sort of tried to back away from it and said, well, he said, this is a complicated issue. Let's turn it over to our foreign ministers. Then the, his aides and everyone look a little, little frantic over across the table. Well, Shevardnadze, the, the Soviet foreign minister, then spoke up and said, no, this is not an issue for the foreign ministers. This is an issue for the heads of state. But he came back in, and I said, well, let me be sure I got that right. And he repeated it. And at that point, we thought, oh, my goodness, he's just giving it away. 
It was the most dramatic heads of state meeting I've ever been in. The final roadblock had been overcome. Almost. Gorbachev had to go home and face a hostile party Congress. Until he survived that test, he couldn't make a full public announcement on East Germany. That would come a few weeks later at Gorbachev's country home. With Kohl making promises of substantial economic aid, Gorbachev, in return, gave his okay to Germany's NATO membership. That was the final breakthrough. That was the moment that sealed the deal. Germany can unify as part of NATO. German unification, rapid fire German unification, just 329 days after the wall came down, was, was going to happen. A jubilant Helmut Kohl returned to Germany having achieved his dream faster than anyone could have ever imagined. In the weeks following, German unification became official with lightning speed. On October 1st, 1990, the four victorious powers of World War II formally gave up their rights to Germany. And two days later, October 3rd, 1990, the two Germanys became one. What the? So that's how it was. It was an amazing time, a dramatic time. In these days, many things were done by gentlemen's agreement. And I think this trust between George Bush, Helmut Kohl, and Mikhail Gorbachev has played a crucial role in the whole process. It's a partnership. We were partners in that major unification process that put an end to the Cold War. But for Gorbachev, peace came at a price. In December 1991, he was forced to resign, blamed for the fall of the Soviet Empire. One of his last phone calls before leaving the Kremlin was to his friend, George Bush. He called up to say goodbye. He was leaving that very day as head of the Soviet Union. Felt like you were saying goodbye to a friend. And they had a remarkable conversation in which Gorbachev seemed to need reassurance that he'd done the right things. He said history will judge us well, won't it? You're saying goodbye to a man who's been through hell is now leaving the scene and doing it with grace and class. And so I was taught as a young kid to respect that kind of thing, and I still do. People sometimes don't understand how you can feel this way about this communist so-and-so, but uh, I, I do in my heart. For the German people, the process of becoming one again has proved to be a work in progress. Some people say there is still a wall, a mental wall between us and West. I think that's, that's an exaggeration. There are differences in behavior, there are differences in points of view. Even young people who grew up after the fall of the wall feel as Wessis or Ossis. I think we underestimated how long the unification process would take. Everything changed everything. And Eastern people had to change much more than we had to change. We realize now that it will be at least another generation until we feel more like one people. And of course, economically, there have been many disappointments uh, as well. Sometimes I, uh, I make jokes about it and say, well, next time we do it better. But uh, on balance, I would say it has been a big success story. Twenty years after the fall of the wall, when the leaders who brought the Cold War to a peaceful end gathered in Berlin, it was clear that their friendship remains intact. To learn more about this program, please visit the WALL website at pbs.org.
Major funding for After the Wall, A World United, was provided by a grant from the Robert Bosch Stiftung, supporting international understanding and research and teaching in the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. The Rios Berlin Commission, preserving the ideals of German-American friendship. The Ed Rochelle Foundation, benefiting charitable, scientific, literary, and educational initiatives. Fresenius Medical Care, providing products and support for chronic kidney diseases. And the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, a German political foundation promoting freedom, peace, and justice through educational programs, with additional funding from the Fondren Foundation, Shell Oil Company, and Houston Zangerbund.